Hamilton, and the third goes in. The first black um, basketball player of any note, was, I think, was recognized in 1904. They had, they had in New York in, in the 19 teens, there were a number of uh, good basketball teams around New York mm -hmm. uh, and organized in leagues and everything like that. So they've been playing basketball. But the barnstorming, at, in the early days, professional basketball really meant barnstorming. Yeah. Okay, it wasn't like there was a league. I think the leagues didn't come into, into existence until in, in the 20s, the mid-20s. The black legends of professional basketball, founded by Wayne State star and alumni John Klein, a lifelong Detroiter, recently held their first ever reunion in Detroit. Their history, which spans the years 1923 to 1959, is full of firsts, most now forgotten. The legends, shut out of organized leagues due to the prevailing racist attitudes of the time, became a force to be reckoned with. In fact, an all-black team called the Harlem Wrens beat all comers and were named world champs in 1939. The New York Wrens, probably one of the greatest teams of all time, uh, put a record together of 88 straight wins, and they were taken on all comers. All comers. 88 straight. No, nowhere in the history of professional basketball has that ever happened before. Actually, the first integrated team in the organized major league was in 1941. And Bill Jones, who's here tonight, was the, fir was the first black player to play in an integrated, on an integrated team in 1941 with the, with the Toledo White Huts. Now, in 19, this is during the war, right? So in 1943, that was a drain on professional basketball players, white players, because the war was on, and many of them went into the service. Mm -hmm. So this kind of opened the door for a few of the ball players to play on white teams in the National Basketball League. And so the Chicago Studebakers brought, into, brought a team into existence that was about half and half, half black and half white. It was 1943, right. right? After the war, they went back to business as usual. All of us played on the card with the NBA. See, a lot of people know, didn't, don't know that we played to keep the NBA alive back in the 50s. I mean, we played the game before. Uh, it was too double-headed like NBA. They couldn't draw people. All right. Mm -hmm. So we would play. Uh, and they so You were their draw. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The league wasn't drawing anything. We couldn't really go into the NBA. In fact, I had a trial with the Milwaukee Hawks. A lot of people didn't know that the team, uh, St. Louis, I mean, the Atlantic Hawks was the Milwaukee Hawks, became the St. Louis Hawks, and now the Atlantic Hawks. But I was, uh, at the time I tried, I was 20 years old, and I was just like Herschel. I was scared to take a chance because they only had a couple of uh, black players in the NBA. Couldn't eat in restaurants and had money in your pocket sleeping in people's homes instead of hotels. The economy wasn't such that guys made a lot of money back in those days, but, but in, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, guys used to travel in cars and, and sometimes uh, uh, small buses, and you know, and they, they oftentimes if they played a game and they, they might have to divide up the proceeds of that game, whatever the money that was made, they would split maybe $10 between them, all right? So they'd come away with a dollar fifty cent, a dollar and seventy-five, and the owner and manager would probably get two dollars and okay. you know and that's the kind of money they made you know a lot of nights out there the money that we made these guys get for eating money today that's what that's what the pay was so i won't tell you how much that was but it was in 1926 that the opportunity most of the legends would become famous for was created the Harlem Globetrotters and its owner, Abe Saperstein, took these athletes, frustrated beyond belief by the two-for system, you know, only two blacks per team, and gave them an outlet to showcase what the future of pro ball would look like. Today, some scoff at Trotters ball as clown ball, but that's not how it started, and that's not how it was. Globetrotters started, Harlem Globetrotters started in 1927. They weren't playing comedian ball. They were playing, they were doing just like the Rams. They were playing to win. And they established good records just like, somewhat like the Rams. Maybe not quite as good as the Rams, but they established great records. And I just mentioned to you, in 1940, they were the second world championship, second world champions uh, in the Chicago uh, World Championship Tournament. Okay. So they, and that was nothing 
com com comic like going on at that during that time. We had a lot of good basketball players during that time. Everybody that wasn't just a clown. There was a lot of straight ball players like myself and the majority of these guys. They were more of a basketball player. All the history has been hidden from them. You know, you know, it was white people that didn't let them know that we could play. You know, I was all city in New York City and was supposed to go to Globetrotter out of high school. You know, and I went to Winston-Salem uh, uh, Teachers College in North Carolina for one year. And when I went down there, I was all CIAA the first year, you know, so I could play. You know, there wasn't no doubt about that. I never did any clowning at all. I put the ball in the basket. I know one year the Trotters played, uh, before I got there, the Trotters played a team called the O'Brien Brothers, and they lost. So the next year, me, Ernie Wagner, and, and uh, Herman Taylor played this team. We beat them by 45 points. We do clown, because that's what they were known for. Mm -hmm. A lot of people come out to see that type of stuff. But then, you know, you have to play straight basketball before you can clown. You can't clown if you're losing. I enjoyed playing with the Globetrotters. I didn't really enjoy what I was seeing being done to us as athletes or whatever. So um, I, I spoke up. I asked questions. And the question that I asked was, we were getting ready to go overseas. And Mr. Saperstein was talking about cutting salaries. And I was married with a family. And I was like, man, it seems like to me you're going to up the salary. You know, mm -hmm. well, it was cheap to live over in Europe. It was cheap, cheap to live overseas. But that, that didn't have anything to do with it. You know, uh -huh. we still putting the same kind of time in, mm -hmm. uh, seven days a week, twice on Sundays. Seven days a week. And just like Herschel says, sometimes we play two games on Sunday. And uh, I joined the team in 1954 and played to 1967. Okay. I was born and raised here in Detroit. I went to Wayne State, played there with Johnny Klein and Charlie Primus. And when I stopped playing at Wayne, I went with the Harlem Globetrotters. The black legends of pro basketball are about a lot of things. They want to set the record straight. They want to honor their own. They'd like to offer assistance to those who may need it, those who once upon a time were the best there was. And yes, they want the recognition they deserve as bona fide pioneers who took the blows and paved the way for those still to come. Once more, it's the genius of the dribble, Marcus Haynes. Nobody, but nobody can dribble a basketball like that man Haynes. Over a four decade span, Haynes played in more than 12,000 games, traveled over 4 million miles, and entertained fans in 97 countries across the globe. Now he becomes the first player elected to the Hall of Fame as a member of the Harlem Globetrotters. Finally, another look at Marcus Haynes, unquestionably the greatest dribbler who ever lived. Ladies and gentlemen, Marcus Haynes. Marcus is joined by his brother, Wendell. And he is welcomed to the Hall of Fame and presented with his ring by Hall of Famer, John McClendon. Let me tell you just how I got here. There's a recently founded foundation called the Black Legends of Basketball Foundation. And these gentlemen are ones who played not only with the Harlem Globetrotters some years ago, but the New York Renaissance with the uh, Harlem Road Kings, the Harlem Magicians, and other teams, mostly those teams prior to the days of the beginning of the NBA and other professional league teams. But I would like for members of this group just to stand up wherever you are. Johnny Klein is the one who started this group, the Black Legends of Professional Basketball. Johnny Klein and the Black Legends. This is a special occasion for Marcus. We have invited a few of his old friends to drop by. Here they are, the Harlem Globetrotters. Frank Washington, Chuck Holton, John Klein, Gene Hudgens, and Meadowlock Lemons. 